back to applications. Um, what's happened there? So many of you know me, um, um, but I just will very briefly show you who I am and what my background is. Um, I've been working in steam turbines for the last 34 years. I started in blading and aerodynamics, but during my career, I, I led um, the Alstom and NG uh, R&D team. I led the engineering team. And for one year during the merger between Alstom and GE, I uh, led the steam turbine product line. Uh, but at the end of last year, I uh, left GE and I now work uh, part-time uh, as a consultant through a company called Expert Connect, but I am consulting for GE and part of the area I'm consulting is in the area of um, turbines for small modular reactors. Um, want to emphasize, this is me talking. This is not GE's opinion, nor is it Expert Connect's opinion. Nothing I show you is, um, um, everything I show you is either public domain from the internet, or it is something that I have created specifically for this presentation. So there's no GE confidential drawings or things that I will be able to show you today. Um, I'm a turbine engineer, but when you're a turbine engineer, you have to care about the steam generator. Um, and in this case, that means that we're going to have to talk about the reactor because it is the reactor that is creating the um, requirements for the steam turbine. I hope, as you will see from this talk, my style I hope is rather informal. Um, and I may say some things that some of you may consider slightly controversial. OK, what do I want to talk through today? So first of all, let's we'll spend a bit of time reminding ourselves why all the noise about SMRs and then what is an SMR? and you'll see that what is an SMR is a bit open to interpretation. We'll look at uh, just very briefly some of the public data for some of the reactors that are closest to development and we'll talk about what constraints they put on the turbine design. When we do that, we'll recognize that there is some crossplay between large nuclear turbines and nuclear turbines for um, uh, these uh, small modular reactor applications. And therefore, we we'll say, what can we learn from a large nuclear turbine that's applicable? And indeed, we'll look a bit at scaling from half to full speed. Wetness effects, we will spend some time on because wetness effects in these turbines will be more important than they have been in any other turbines during the, the history of steam turbines. And we'll discuss what are the physics that may make that the case. The words phrased are small modular reactor, and we'll have a bit of discussion about what it means to be, what modular will mean in terms of the steam turbine island. Then, um, much more briefly, we'll look at reactors that are a bit further away, so called generation four reactors, uh, pull out a few messages for what that means for the turbines for uh, generation four reactors, and then we'll, we'll put that together with a few conclusions. Um, I believe a uh, question and answer question at the end, which Sabi will moderate. You're meant to be engineers, otherwise you wouldn't be on this call. So we'll have a little bit of technical in there and the two areas where we will uh, talk a bit of physics. One, when we're talking about the scaling, we'll talk about some physics around dimension analysis. And then because it's particularly important for why wetness is so important in these machines, we'll talk about some of the, uh, briefly about the physics of droplet nucleation. The rest of it will be more kind of business talk. Okay, why all the noise about SMLs? Well, today we're all environmentalists, of course, um, and, Nuclears in general are largely carbon dioxide free. Now, I say largely because actually when you make them, you normally pour an awful lot of concrete um, when, you're, when you're building the site. Um, and the next big advantage of nukes is, of course, that you, unlike the wind, which blows when it wants to, and the sun, which shines when it wants to, uh, you can have the nuclear power when you want to have the nuclear power. It is what we call in the industry dispatchable. 
and at least relevant for this year, uh, we're not dependent on Russia for fuel. Why small and modular? So the argument is that small and modular will reduce the construction time and with the reduced construction time, the financial risk compared with large nuclear machines. And secondly, that they are cheaper power than the large nuclear machines. The argument being that when you can build more in factories and ship as modules, then you should be able to reduce the cost of the machines. But a couple of buts. <laughs> um, you, we could have built small modular fossil machines. We could have built rather than a thousand megawatt um, steam turbines, we could have built 10, 100 megawatt steam turbines. The, the boiler and the uh, could have been much more modular than it is and shipped much more. Modular. And we never did that. We never did that because it never made economic sense to do that. And we will look a bit at that issue, particularly from the steam turbine point of view. Um, and of course, just as a, some costs are pretty independent of size. And if you think of things like the cost of your security system around your, your power plant, which is an important thing if you've got a nuclear power plant, those kind of things are going to be pretty independent of size anyway. Nonetheless, and, and I think the case is unproven for small modular reactors and we'll come on to why, there are some niches where they probably make an awful lot of sense. And for example, in the United States, there are some 300 megawatt coal plants at the longer very at the end of very long grid transmission lines. If you want to, um, uh, uh, when you replace that power plant, if you want to put it in the same place and use the same grid transmission line, then of course that gives you a size. It gives you the 300 megawatt size that you want for the replacement. And if that replacement is nuclear, then that, that tells you what size nuclear plant you would want. And um, I don't know what you all think about um, the recent debacle in the UK about uh, who's leader of conservative and who's uh, prime minister. But both Ms. Truss and Mr. Sunak during the campaign things, they went to Derby and they talked about what a great opportunity SMRs were for Rolls Royce for export from the UK. So it is a politically trendy subject in the moment. So that's why people make noise about SMRs today. It's CO2 free nearly, it's dispatchable, and it is meant to be significantly cheaper and quicker to market than large nukes. Okay, so having discussed why all the noise about SMRs, let's just think about what is an SMR. So the first question I want to ask is what do we mean by small? So if you look, uh, you can search on internet, if you look, you'll find that there are reactors under development from below 10 megawatts electric to greater than 500 megawatts electric. Um, I'm sure many of you have read or seen um, uh, Jonathan Swift's satire about Gulliver. Um, and we all remember he went to Lilliput, uh, which was where the very small people are. Um, but he also afterwards went to Brodingnab where the very large people are, and it's only in Brodignab that a machine like the Rolls Royce one, 500 megawatts, is small. 500 megawatts is a big plant. It's comparable in size, for example, to the ADRs in the UK, like uh, location, partly full size would be. Uh, we never called those small. Um, GEH are sizing their plants at 300 megawatts, still quite a big plant. Um, GEH are targeting those transmission lines that I was telling you about, but there are very many below 50 megawatts. And this is an interesting story, and we'll talk a bit more as we go through it. The reactor developers cannot have reached no consensus at all about what size. They go from small, uh, sub 10 megawatts in some cases, up to what actually is a very large machine. Which is uh, which is a Rolls Royce case, uh, 1.5 gigawatts thermal, half a gigawatt electric. Okay, what is modular? So this is I think is clearer for everybody. The 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 idea is that components or subcomponents can be built in a factory. If you build it in a factory, it is supposed to, and it typically does, help your safety, help your quality, help your cost. 
and help your delivery or schedule. And then you have standardized interfaces, you ship it to site and you, um, um, uh, and it's plug and play. That's the plan. And that's what makes it quick at site. That's the plan. Um, and I'm not going to talk about whether that makes sense or not for director, but there is a debate about to what extent the steam turbine generator should be modular, whatever the reactor can do. And I just like to put you a a a a a a, a, a mile point, point in the sand and say, you know, today if we build a combined cycle power plant, it can be operating three years after you 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 place the order. So one and a half years for for the steam turbine to be able to work, one and a half years to do everything else. Um, uh, uh, can be less. That compares, and this is bad examples, but if you look at Flamanville, if you look at latest forecasts, I think point, we are talking a very large number of years, and it is the reactor that is completely dominating the time constraint. And as we see, as we go through, the benefits of modularization are not clear if you are not on the critical path for the project. And what is the reactor? Well, uh, as I said, quick search on the internet, you'll find over 90 small modular reactors in development. Um, uh, and they are all things to all men. There are massively different variants out there. Um, we're talking uh, fission reactors. And we will actually make a couple of comments further down the line about fusion reactors, but they are a very long way away. All the first mark, mark reactors to market um, are either BWRs or PWRs. So that means, so boiling water reactors, pressurized water reactors, that means that they are, in terms of the steam that they are supplying for the power cycle, very like today's large news. Hinkley Point is a PWR, Flamanville is a PWR, and Rolls-Royce is uh, a PWR. Sorry, that was my pen falling on the floor. Um, longer term, with the Gen 4 reactors, the conditions start to change. But probably all machines really ordered in the next five years or even longer will be with steam conditions like the PWRs and the BBRs, because those are the reactor manufacturers that are much the closest to market. Um, GH is already trying to get uh, uh, an, an order for its BWR for OPG for Darling, for, for OPG in, in Canada. So we will concentrate today on BWR, PWR steam conditions. And they are essentially the same, except uh, the boiling waters and uh, the steam is slightly radioactive, which affects your materials choice. Longer term, there are many of the so-called, uh, there are many variants of reactors, Gen 4, reactors, generation four kinds, and if they are using a ranking cycle for the powertrain, then they will have steam conditions like uh, conventional supercritical or ultra supercritical, or even what we call advanced ultra supercritical, that essentially means uh, nickel alloy is operating around 700 degrees C. So we'll just very briefly look at some public data on uh, just extracted from the websites of four reactor manufacturers. This is um, from the Rolls Royce uh, website. Um, I have to say the building looks very trendy to me. But when you look at the building, you see this is not a small machine. This is a big machine. And when you look inside the, the reactor hall there, you also reconfirm that this is a big machine. When you um, uh, look at what Rolls-Royce is saying and in conversations what they are doing, they are very focused on breaking this machine down into very standardized components that they can deal with in their factories and minimize all the assembly work at, 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 at site. And um, that may make an awful lot of sense for the reactor itself. We'll discuss what it means for the for the turbine. This is a, a step smaller. This is uh, from the EDF website, uh, uh, their new one. 
development project, uh, better you get a better feel of the size of the thing by looking at the building. And again, you can see this is a. This is a. <laughs> Toby, can you mute? Could, you, could you go on up mute, please? Um, um, so, um, yeah, so this is you look at the picture on the top left, you see the building, you see the size of these things. These are also things that are too big to ship in a uh, typically as a built reactor. They're still going to be shipped as components, but it is much more at this size capable of being shipped as components, as as as, as more um, uh, uh, built up components than at the 500 megawatt size of the Rolls Royce. This is the first time this this size. This is still a PWR, and this is uh, again a, a design that's been discussed. This is the first size, and this is sub 50 megawatt, probably electric. It may be around slightly above. Uh, this is the first uh, size where you can truly put the reactor on a transporter and move it to site and then ship it in and plug and play. Um, um, uh, and But what you have to recognize with this machine is that, uh, depending exactly where it comes out, you will need order 20 of these machines for one Hinkley Point unit, 40 for the two units that are going to go to Hinkley Point C. So what this size, you get down to something that is truly transportable, truly can think all the benefits of modularization and building the factory, but you're paying for that with the by having actually a pretty small machine and you need a lot of them to get to the kind of size of, uh, well, um, 10 of them or so to get to Rolls-Royce size, 20, um, and, and sorry, can, and now I've got myself confused. Uh, um, uh, Hingley Point is 1800 megawatts per unit, um, and this is 50, 60 megawatts. Okay, um, and the last one I just want to show you briefly is the GEH one. Uh, so getting on for a similar kind of size as the um, Rolls Royce. The building is slightly less trendy looking than the Rolls Royce building, but otherwise you see it's pretty comparable in terms of how the power plant is is actually physically looking. And it is GEH who, who are focused on the, uh, who have designed this for that niche I was talking about, although obviously they want to use it much more widely than this niche. Now, this is interesting just to stand back. These are four reactors I've shown you, essentially similar cooling conditions from those reactors going down from 50 megawatts to 500 megawatts and these are independent decisions that four reaction manufacturers have made and they are playing off the advantage of a sizable power against the advantage of really being able to build modules uh, and, and pre-assemble as much as possible of, of the uh, machine at um, in the factory and do the minimum amount of work at site. And that obviously what you see is there's no consensus. There is no, to date, the reaction manufacturers have not reached a conclusion about what is a credible size for a small modular reactor. And when you start breaking models, modul modules up, you actually have to recognize that even the very big machines, Hinkley Point C, 1800 megawatts, that has modules. The steam turbine is shipped as modules. And from the steam per per turbine point of view, uh, the lube oil system is shipped on a skid as a module. So even on the very biscuit sides, we have some things that we call modules. And it's just a scale. Uh, and where the true economic optimum on that scale is, is for me completely unproven. It is not proven to me, except for niche applications, that SMRs, are the right solution, or if they are the right solution, whether they will be order 50 megawatts or order 500 megawatts. Okay, that was the input from the reactor. Now let's say, no, so the, and let's say these are all essentially BWR, PWRs with very similar steam conditions, and these are all the ones that are relatively close to market. So what does that tell us about the turbine that we need for those sets of applications? 
Well, first of all, as we said, it's a, it's a PWR expansion like Flamingo, uh, and that tells us about the and that, that tells us about the steam. It's obviously less steam for because it's smaller, but it's um, uh, very similar steam conditions. Now let's spend a little time just talking about evaluation rates. Now, when you're designing a turbine, evaluation rate is a very critical question. It's how much cost do I put into this machine in order to make it more efficient? And you know, just practically, it's nearly always true through in most stages, you put up the cost, you improve efficiency. Um, uh, evaluation rate is, a, is very key for determining how the steam turbine should be designed. So what's driving the evaluation rate of these small SMR turbines? Well, the fuel costs nothing. All the cost is the capital cost. And just order of magnitude number, just order of magnitude number. For a BWR or PWR, this STG uh, is older, 5% of the cost of the plant. But it is delivering 110% of the net electrical output ish. And that, whether it's 110 or 105, it depends on the auxiliaries, it depends whether the boiler feed pump is electrically driven or not. But basically the STG is reducing over 100% because some of that power has to go back into the rest of the system in order to, to make the system work. And just think about what those means. If the capital cost is the only cost of the turbine, of, of this power plant, and that's, not so wrong for 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 a nuke imagine that you put you spent an extra 20 percent which is a mammoth number on the cost of your steam turbine then if the steam turbine only costs five percent your power plant has now gone up by one point by gone up by one percent of of the cost so your electricity has gone up by one percent uh in in cost but if it's if, if, if we're creating 110%, if with that 20% increase in cost, we've managed to improve the turbine efficiency by 1%, then we'll have got 1.1% more power out of the thing. So that would evaluate. And that tells you a story. It tells you that efficiency and, by the way, life, because the other big cost is the decommissioning cost. Or I'll come back to that point. The other big cost is the decommissioning cost. But um, um, uh, it tells you that these machines, from the turbine point of view, will be very high evaluation machines, ones where it's worth putting a lot of cost into making the machine very efficient. Just as an aside, um, uh, because we have been discussing with potential fusion manufacturers, uh, uh, reactor, uh, not then one manufacturer states, but um, uh, things like UKA, AEA, who are talking about their future machines, fusion machines, they may get to the point where 80% of the net electrical, uh, of, the, of the gross electrical power is used to drive the fusion process because they have to get a plasma up to 150 million degrees C. And they're doing that with massive magnets and they need to do that uh, repeatedly um, uh, and that uses an awful lot of electrical power. So uh, there are concepts that are better than that but the point is you know you, you would get that on these machines you get incredibly high evaluation rates for the um uh, for the steam turbine really worth putting cost in to get efficiency out um okay so steam turbine for the generator for all these nsmrs the key things are going to be long life high performance evaluation and in short term they're going to have steam conditions like today's PWRs. So, actually, it's worth looking at. But that's sorry, that picture is exactly the same for large machines, large nuclear like HPC. Same steam conditions, same evaluation rates. So, it's worth when you're thinking about what steam turbine you need to start by thinking, what does what can we learn? from the large machines, which are designed to the same set of criteria, just less steam. So this is a picture of GE's Arabelle machine. Um, 
my opinion, I think most people's opinion, certainly based on um, market share, is that Arabel is today's datum large machine. It's the machine that's um, going to exist at uh, Hinkley Point, that's been built for Hinkley Point. It's the target machine for Sizewell. Um, EDF uh, are planning to build six uh, EPR machines in, 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 in France, and it's the agreed machine for those as well. So it is the dominant machine at large size. Um, we'll talk a bit about why, but because the volume flows are enormous, the, um, uh, it's, it runs at half speed at 1500 RPM. And uh, it's complex. It's complex compared with its competitors. And it's complex in terms of its design. Let me just run you through this machine. So the, the steam is entering through these pipes under here, expanding through the HP, going out through the diffuser here with a complex extraction diffuser here that needs additional pipe work and so on, goes out through these uh, pipes to the moisture separator reheater, comes back as uh, uh, reheated steam, expands, uh, com comes back in through these pipes, expands through this IP section, again, a complex extraction diffuser with its um, uh, associated piping and so forth. Um, and this HIP is complex and uh, difficult compared to a, a simple HP. Uh, and then uh, comes out the back of the IP down through this crossover pipes and depending on the back pressure, so, for example, at Hintley Point, there are uh, three double flow LP cylinders, um, each with a 75 inch last stage blade. That is, uh, so it's complex in the design here. It has far more pipes than, than a minimum. Um, it, compared to its competitors, the, for the competitors, these four stages here are actually put in front of the, uh, in the front of the LPs. Uh, which means here they would be six flow as opposed to one flow. Having it one flow uh, has created lots of complexity, as I said, but it has uh, made it single flow, which raises the efficiency of this part of the expansion significantly. Um, we'll look uh, on the next page a little bit about how it compares to a fossil steam turbine, but because the volume effects are so very large, uh, large at half speed, We'll look at what it means in terms of the wetness of the flow, but, but wetness is a, managing the wetness is a key feature of this machine. And although the machine is fundamentally very efficient, uh, its cycle performance is relatively low because the Carnot efficiency is low because the inlet temperature is low compared to a fossil machine. So Arabel is a performance optimized design and we've said that we for SMRs, we also need a performance optimized design where we've where the designers have accepted additional complexity, which affects the whole layout of the plant to gain efficiency because performance is highly evaluated on Arabel. OK, and we will now look at the uh, briefly at the expansion line that goes with that. Uh, I hope as engineers, you all understand the Mollier diagram, entropy on the, so disorder on the on, on, on the horizontal axis, enthalpy, which is like the energy of a flowing system on the vertical line. Um, uh, and uh, then this is this is steam. The red lines are lines of constant temperature. If this was a perfect gas, they would be horizontal. The green lines are line of constant uh, pressure. Um, the blue line is the equilibrium saturation line and I use the word equilibrium carefully because we're going to be talking about non-equilibrium in a bit um, uh, and if you go into this region then you, the, you, you these are um, uh, dryness fractions uh, lines of constant dryness fraction and these lines are both lines of constant pressure and constant, constant temperature just like to remind everybody this condition in the middle here does not exist this is just it means some fraction of steam dry here, dry here, and some fraction of water here gives us an average condition that is in the middle here. But physically, no steam has this property. Okay, and if we put on that, this is a uh, supercritical fossil expansion. You can see it's supercritical because it's star. This is a constant pressure line. You see these. Con this is a constant pressure line that actually goes through the critical point. And you can see this is just above 
that pressure line so by definition it's supercritical it expands in the hp goes back off to the boiler uh, reheats um, and then expands in the ip to about here and then in the op down to here to about 10 percent wet very standard fossil expansion this is a PWR expansion. The, 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 steam, the heat being rejected by the reactor is much colder um, uh, and pressurized and water reactor. The reaction basically, the, the steam cycle basically starts on the saturation line. The HP is wholly wet, expands to perhaps 15% wet. Um, uh, then, we, then we go to a moisture separator reheater. So in the moisture separator, the large droplets are removed, which puts us to something about here. And then, then we, in the reheater, the small droplets are removed and then we superheat the steam. And then, uh, well, in, 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 in an uh, Arabelle machine, this part of the expansion is done in the IP and then the LP is effectively wet. So comparing those, you can see, um, the HP here is fully wet compared to fully dry, and the LP is substantially more wet than the uh, than the fossil. Handling moisture is a key feature of today's nuclear turbine design, by which we mean turbines with PWR type steam conditions. Just as an aside, back in the UK, if you look at the old AGRs, gas cooled reactors, they had uh, uh, um, um, they, they were much rejecting into much hotter into the power cycle and they essentially had the equivalent of a fossil uh, expansion line with no particular uh, moisture issues associated with them. Okay, we're going to uh, scale the turbine now and a very brief technical diversion because we should all understand dimensional analysis. I, I have to say my experience of most engineers is they don't or they've forgotten it. So we'll just very briefly mention dimensional analysis because it's one of the things that I continuously beat into my team in Alstom when I work in GE when I work with them. To remind you, all terms in any physically valid equation must have the same dimensions. If there's meters per second on the left hand side, that meters per second on every term in the right hand side. And therefore you can rearrange that equation to be uh, dimensionless. If you've done that, then you have the there you have the independent variables uh, on one side. The dependent variables are the result of that. And if all the independent dimensionless groups, not the parameters themselves, but the groups that are made of them, are maintained, then the dependent ones are also maintained. So let's apply that and scale the turbine. Um, so let's imagine we're going to multiply this the rotational speed by. Let's say two, because we're going to do two. Uh, and then we would divide the length scale by two, and we maintain the same heat drop across the machine. If we do that, then all the main independent dimensionless groups, so flow coefficient, loading coefficient, actually mark numbers, everything, uh, all the main important dimensionless groups remain unchanged. and. Um, uh, there are two that we need to look at with significance later, but the main ones remain unchanged because the main ones remain changed. The dependent groups are also largely unchanged. So therefore you scale it, first order deficiency is unchanged as long as you are maintaining order dimensional groups. Um, the volume flow, though, the steam you're taking into this and therefore the power you're producing, this group remains unchanged, but uh, when you look at this, del H is unchanged, omega uh, has been changed by F, and therefore, when you look at this, to maintain this group, the volume flow, therefore the power, is decreased by, by F squared. So if F is 2, then by a factor of 4. Also, and we, we people tend to forget this, the mechanical parameters are also all maintained. As long as we've done our scaling properly, as long as we've maintained all the non-dimensional groups correctly, things like stress, dimensional parameters, dimensions parameters are unchanged. And in this case, as I've kept LH cared, I kept Q2 omega 4 maintained, stress itself is maintained. Uh, and things like dimension, uh, things like vibration frequencies are uh, are just with the scale, but 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 you can directly work them. That's why model testing works. There are, however, two groups that are important that do not scale. 
The first one is the Reynolds number. Um, I've chosen to dimensionless without a length scale because I, I, I like doing that because length scale is already getting towards a, a design. Um, uh, that parameter, if, if you half the size, you half the Reynolds number. And the other uh, very important one is however you choose, whatever group you're using to characterize wetness effects. If you are a German speaker and we're in Switzerland today, if you're a German speaker, you're probably using a damp color as a non-dimensional expansion rate to characterize wetness effects. And it's not so familiar to, to UK people. Um, and just to comment, Reynolds number effects, so this is viscous effects, and if the flow is turbulent, we know that um, ter that uh, viscous effects go something like Reynolds number to the minus 0.2. So yes, there's a Reynolds number effect for changing by factor two, but it's not a massive effect, and it's only scaling on the viscous terms. Okay, so let's take that and let's scale out of that. Arabelle has uh, two variants, uh, um, uh, one at around 1100 megawatts and one at about 1800 megawatts. If you were to, and they're in a runs at half speed, if you scale it simply to full speed, you see that you get a 275, which is not far from where, G, where GH want their machine, and 450 megawatts at full speed. And remember, this is an optimized machine for this set of applicate, for these set of constraints. and We've shown that the set of constraints for the PWRs in SMRs are similar. So this should be not far from an optimized design for, um, uh, for, for, for this set of constraints. If you were to double the speed again, you'd get to 17 or 110 megawatts, which is pretty well actually the sizes where some of the other machines we're looking at are. Just a note though, while mowing from half speed to full speed, Basically, you just need, we need to rewire the generator to get back to grid frequency. Any other speed, um, and you're going to need to get to gearbox to get back to grid. And if you have a gearbox, you can just choose the speed you like because you've already paid the cost of the gearbox. So, for the larger SMRs, PWR, PWR, so Rolls Royce GH type machines, expect to see machines that are not far from scales of today's large half-speed machines. For the smaller machines, if you want an efficiency optimized machine, you will almost certainly go high speed. But some of that complexity you'll find you can't evaluate as well on the small sizes because that in the cost of that um, complexity does not scale with size. So expect them to be like the bigger ones with a bit more single pad. Okay, now um, I want to talk about wetness. Wetness is going to be a key differentiator for nuclear machines, for SMRs, and um, they already, handling them is already a big issue on the large machines. I'm going to show you why it's a much bigger issue still on uh, SMR size machines. Um, I'm going to put some math and equations and pictures on this graph about, uh, and read them if you want. Uh, but I'm going to tell the story in a slightly simpler way and not go through all the points that are on the slide in detail. So steam is, we're on the molly diagram, we're expanding, we've reached the saturation line. If we did this expansion slowly, at that point, water would start to form as droplets. But it, we don't do that expansion slowly. Everything that happens in the turbine very quickly. It's actually going to something like 60 meters per second. So um, um, so there isn't, uh, so it, so we, so, so that's the first point. It's happening very quickly. And the second point is there is a barrier to the droplet nucleation. And that is when you form a small droplet, then the, the surface of that doc, doc, of that droplet has surface tension and, uh, small droplets, that surface tension will squash the droplet. Above a certain size, the heat released due to the condensation is greater than the energy put into the surface tension and droplets can grow. But below that size, the surface tension effect dominates the heat and droplets will uh, just, if they form, will just disappear. Droplets form randomly all the time because there are lots of 
uh, the, the molecules are just randomly moving about. And sometimes, oh, we're close together, we're a droplet. Um, uh, and there is a probability of a droplet of any size just naturally forming. But as, but when uh, initially those droplets are much smaller than the critical size um, and, and get squashed away. The critical size gets bigger and bigger as you get further away from equilibrium because um, uh, the heat released by the condensation then is, is much bigger. And we can characterize that by the supercooling, how much the, the condition is below the, 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 for that pressure, how much te temperature are we below the saturation line. So we have to get uh, and, 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 and suddenly, as you, as you go through the expansion, you suddenly reach critical size where a significant number of droplets can form. And at that point, lots of droplets come out uh, and, this, and thermodynamically the system can start to relax to go back towards equilibrium. In a HP turbine, with the set of conditions there, that normally happens pretty well at 14 degrees C of supercooling. In an LP turbine, that normally happens at about 25 degrees of supercooling. Okay, that's background stuff. What's important is to think about what happens to droplets. That, I'm sorry, there are losses generated during that nucleation process. It's called the fun, fundamental thermodynamic loss. But then there are losses that happen afterwards. And those losses happen afterwards because the droplets that are formed don't follow the flow. They don't, they can't, they don't go around the corners as quickly as the steam, and they don't, uh, and they lag the flow in terms of, uh, in terms of temperature. And the ones that don't go around the corners, they hit blades, they form films, they go to trailing edges, they form enormous droplets to then erode blades and so forth. So all the bad stuff about droplets after the thermodynamics comes from them not following the flow, either kinematically or thermodynamically. The deviation is what matters. And small droplets, um, and we'll talk a bit about small and large, but small droplets follow the flow very well. They follow the flow because the viscous forces on them are sufficient to make them go around the corners. And uh, for the same total amount of steam, they have a much, much larger surface area. So uh, the heat can um, uh, move in and out of the droplets much more easily. Large droplets, deviate from the flow. Good, so what does that mean for the scaled turbine? So when a turbine is scaled from half speed to, to full speed, the expansion rate is double. That means that uh, as, you, as you're expanding, there's half the time for anything to happen. And we've said it's a random chance for something to, to for droplets to nucleate. But, and therefore nucleation occurs later, but as we see, only very slightly later, with slightly higher supercooling, creating only slightly smaller droplets. Too many slightly on that picture. Uh, and that's because the effect of critical size on nucleation rate, and therefore the effect of supercooling, is far, far bigger and more important than whether we have twice as much time for the droplets to actually form. Just to give you a feel for this, um, if you manage to move, and this will be a big move, if you manage to move nucleation from 14 degrees supercooling to 14 and a half degrees supercooling, and in terms of nucleation rate, that's a big number, um, uh, you would find roughly 3%, only 3% smaller droplets. So the scale turbine has 3% smaller droplets. But when we're interested in does it follow the flow, either thermodynamically or kinematically, what we're interested in is the relative size of the droplets to the length scale of the machine. For example, size of the blade, the radius that the steam has to go, to, of the curvature that steam has to go through as it goes around the corner. So the droplets are 3% smaller, perhaps, but the machine is 50% smaller. So the droplets non-dimensionally are twice as large. 
in the scale machine. This is scaling from full speed to half speed. If you go to high speed, it's gone even more. We deviate much more. We have much higher wetness losses. And um, therefore, my view and, and droplet erosion becomes much worse. Um, if any of you have ever done model turbine testing of an LP fossil turbine, and all the big steam turbine manufacturers had, had test rigs that did that, you will know the efficiency and erosion in the scale is much worse than it is in the uh, full-size machine. And, and this is the fundamental reason why. Managing moisture, I think, will be one of the key technology differentiators for turbine manufacturers for this first set of um, SMRs, which are PW, BWR conditions. Um, there are some great names in the history of thermodynamic modeling, the, the stuff I told you, there's people like Guillemati, people like Freddie Bacter, people like John Young. They did lots of theoretical work. I have to say, their impact on the true design of the machines is being very small. We just sort of managed to cope with the moisture. Maybe this is the time when their work actually really impacts the design of our machines. Last question on, on the modular question moving on. Will the turbine be very standardized? Will it be manufactured in the factory? Well, and if you talk to Rolls Royce, you talk to BWR, you talk to all the others, they're, they're desperate. They think they want to apply these modularization principles that they're developing for the SMR to the turbine. And they want to talk about that all the time. I don't think it will be any more than today, and I'll explain why. First of all, will it be completely standardized? Well, we've all had the discussion about optimization. Uh, um, uh, it always pays to optimize uh, uh, an ST. In a nuclear, the evaluation rates are very high. Will even more always pay. Um, and all the main steam turbine manufacturers have developed processes that allow us to customize steam turbines at nearly standard cost. So, uh, so automated process to design blades for just a height slightly, automated process to swap the LPE blades because the cooling conditions have happened. They will, that will happen here because the uh, evaluation rate is high, and we've already created tools to allow us to do that cheaply and quickly. Will it be modulized? Well, um, my view is the turbine island is unlikely to be on critical path, certainly for that 500 megawatt Rolls Royce size machines. Very, very much doubt it will be on the critical path. Um, because as I said, we can do it in three years uh, to, as we have done for um, uh, in combined cycle machines. Um, the time when that may change is the example I showed you where the reactor was sufficiently small that it could be put on a truck. At that point, you could really be stuck in the reactor. And if you're stuck in the reactor, you may have to stop the turbine. And you certainly may need to have the whole thing on a module. But that already exists today. If you look at small sizes, industrial steam turbines, they come on a skid, where the skid is normally the lube oil tank, they come on a skid with all their accessories already bolted onto that skid. And really, they are already today plug and play. But at larger sizes, that's not true. At larger sizes, we ship the turbine as a set of modules, but we do substantial um, um, uh, assembly work when we get to site. And things like feed heating systems and so on, we don't put them on skids. The reason we don't is because to do so typically increases costs. If you put a heater with its valves and some pipe work and some instrumentation and put it all on a on in some module, then you've got the cost of that module uh, that trans you've got to transport it, which is a bigger thing to transport. Uh, and actually that costs more than simply shipping the heater heater to site and bolting it to the concrete. That's why we don't do it today. And the example that proves this in my mind is combined cycle machines. If you think about a combined cycle machine, uh, so the gas turbine uh, is a module and you can ship it to site. It's smaller than any equivalent reactor. You can get a 300 megawatt gas turbine nearly that you can put on a scared transport around the world, plug it in. Um, 
obviously you have a heat exchange that goes with it, but, but fundamentally that is as modular as any modular reactor will be. And yet for steam plant, we do not modulize all the components. So I think we'll find that one, once, so initially Rolls-Royce and GEH and all the other right manufacturers, right? So the customer is always right. So we'll do what they ask. But longer term, the market is right. And I believe that the market will show that the extent of modularization on the steam turbine will be similar as it is today's combined cycle, because all the constraints are essentially the same as today's combined cycle. But we will compete on optimized performance around standard machines, and we will compete on standardized execution processes. And in the case of modular the SMRs, we will also compete on how uh, we can standardize the various regulatory data and so forth that the uh, power plants need. Okay, I'm going to very briefly talk about Gen 4, but only very briefly. This is what Wikipedia says about Gen 4, uh, and this is the table from Wikipedia. You might want to just glance at the size uh, of these machines, the temperature of these machines, and the coolant for these mach machines. The coolant for the reactor, obviously, be I'm not sure this is a proper word, but the heatant for the um, uh, for the power cycle. Okay, what do we know about these machines? Well, first of all, they're not going to happen today. I think the first ones may be around in ten years uh, at a commercial uh, level, maybe longer. If you look at those temperatures, you'll see they were significantly hotter than the PWRs and BWRs that we are talking about today. If they are steam, if they are ranking cycles, then therefore the turbine design will be similar to today's fossil machines, because it's simply what your heat exchanger temperature is going to drive everything about the design. Um, and indeed, if these are very high evaluation machines, and by the way, as I said, things like fusion, if it ever comes, is incredibly high evaluation rate, then this may be the use case that we never could find for nickel designs because we could never get them to commercially evaluate. But if you look to that coolant list, you'll have seen some materials that where it might be quite difficult to make a safety case, uh, for example, between uh, a sodium and water heat exchanger. So it's not clear that they will all be ranking cycles, uh, the coolant may things, and therefore uh, they may be braking cycles with, uh, for example, some critical CO2 or nitrogen as the operating fluid. And GE has talked to some generators for manufacturers and done some concepts um, uh, on uh, braking cycles as the power cycle. Or uh, for Gen 4 machines. Okay, so just to summarize before we move to questions, for me, it is not proven that SMRs will become a competitive product. I absolutely believe that nuclear will be part of any sensible energy mix in the future, but whether that is large nuclear, whether that is uh, big nuclear like the Rolls Royce, whether that is small machines like 50 megawatts, that for me is completely unproven. There is a playoff there going between the advantage of modularization against the advantage of size, and I don't know where the result will be. I have to say I'm a little skeptical about hundreds of machines. Uh, everything in life has driven us to bigger machines. Look at the look at the um, uh, wind turbines. They started off. Very small, and they're up now at eight megawatts. But the first SMRs to market, first steam turns from steam turbines for SMRs, will have steam conditions to today's large nuclear machines, similar because the reactors are PWRs or BWRs. Like those machines, they will have high evaluation rates. Because of that, because they have the same set of constraints as the large machines, they will be something like full speed scales of today's large half speed machines. And if we're truly pushing for, for performance, the small sizes, they will be half speed. However, I do believe some complexity will go out of those machines because 
complex cost of complexity does not scale with size. As I've shown you, the non-dimensional size of droplets will be big, and that means managing the moisture manage, is going to be critical to the design of these machines. And I believe that's one of the key areas where the manufacturers will compete. Um, and my belief is once the market is settled, the level of modularization around the whole steam cycle part of the plant will be similar to today's combined cycle steam phase. Longer term with Gen 4, temperatures will rise, evaluation rates will remain very high, it may even become very, even higher. If the cycle is ranking, then it will be uh, machines will be similar to today's high efficiency fossil machines and supercrits and ultra supercrits. And but they may instead be breaking cycles um, uh, as the working fluid. Okay, that is uh, my presentation. So, uh, Sabi, are you going to um, facilitate questions? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Pete. Um, well, I would suggest that uh, people write their questions in the chat um and then uh, i can read it out from there just to avoid that we have many people <laughs> trying to speak at the same time um yeah so actually we already have a few questions here so will the presentation available to participants uh, well actually we will make uh, the recording available uh later so then there's a question here about uh, yeah, from VJ Raman. Should we not match SMRs with SCO2 medium? I guess it's super critical uh, call, uh, CO2 medium in the turbines instead of steam. That has been experimented for many years now, up to 25 megawatt, I understand. Could it not be brought uh, to the fore now? So uh, my view, uh, it, it, the reason is exactly the same as it is with the large machines. Um, uh, supercritical CO2 is an option you can still have, um, but but I uh, think steam, as long as you don't have a problem with reactor or something, is an extremely easy medium to use. You have the advantages of the condensation, and just as this is never evaluated for large PWRs. I think it will not evaluate in the same way for SMLs. However, I when we go to Gen 4, as I say, then I think there may be a case for changing away from a ranking steam cycle. And I just see the next one. SGG is steam turbine generator. Sorry, as a single. Oh, sorry, you've answered it. <laughs> yeah, and um, I think there's a question regarding your slide where you showed the um, um, that was on the fusion reactor that the turbine would uh, have to give 500 percent of the electrical power yes so this is a case for Could fusion um, um fusion you to cold fusion is a lie hot fusion uh, happens at about uh, you need to be hotter 10 times hotter than the center of the sun because at the center of the sun you have um, gravity pulling the things together. So for fusion to work, all the demonstrators today have about 150 million degrees C. You have to get the plasma up to that temperature. This is, by the way, why fusion is so safe, because it's so hard to make it happen. Um, um, and you do that by with enormous electromagnets that generate the, uh, that generate, um, uh, that heat up the, the plasma and contain the plasma and unfortunately also because you need to breed tritium inside the reactor it's a stop-start process or it's expected to be a stop-start process and not, unless somebody can find a flow process for for breeding tritium and therefore you keep having to heat this thing up to um, 150 million degrees c it's not lost stuff but you've got to you've got to do it and that means you an almost amount of the power 80 percent is the estimate we had for the first demonstration ones um, uh, of the power is going that the turbine is generating 
is going into the reactor process, leaving only 20% to go to the uh, to go to the grid. Right. Um, thank you. Then the next one. <laughs> yeah. So I agree with Simon's somebody. comment. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I see Scott Simon has talked about a manufacturability issue on the blade. Yeah, on the uh, it's a detail, but it's, yes. it, it, yeah. it's an issue. <laughs> Yeah, and if an 1800 megawatt turbine runs at half speed, then I assume the 475 megawatt turbine running at full speed is one seventh of the annulus area. So it's um, it, we've 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 scaled the machine from half speed to full speed, so that it's a scale factor of two. And that applies to all linear dimensions. And the annulus area is linear dimension squared. And therefore, it is one quarter of the uh, annulus area. And that is why 475 is one quarter of 1800. Okay, thanks. Next one. Uh, okay, record. Yeah, we'll make the recording available. As I mentioned before, uh, then from Simon, uh, oh, wait, it just jumped. Uh, does making the SDG modular really matter? It is uh, the risk and complexity of building the reactor at site that is the primary issue. That, that is my view as well, Simon. Uh, the reactor manufacturers, however, are pushing us to be as modular as possible. They're trying to take the philosophy that they are using on the reactor and applying it to the turbine. And for me, as far as I've seen, unless we go down to the really small sizes, I don't think that makes sense. Yeah, then from Chris Bullo, uh, for a 300 megawatt SMR design, how many reactors do you foresee on a single site? So the if you look, to, so it, it, people are talking potentially multiple reactors on a single site, um, but they're also talking location of a single machine on a, on, on a single site. What I have always seen, however, is a match one reactor to one turbine. And that is essentially so that you can switch the things off. You don't want to have uh, one react if you have one turbine and two reactors, so a two on one like we sometimes do with gas turbines. If the reactor's down, then the the turbine is very difficult. When well, you're running at half power with low pressure, and it doesn't work that well. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> then from Patrick Abner. I know this is not an engineering topic, but may I ask if in your endeavor of this SMR topic, have you got a feel or opinion on how construction licensing might change? I often hear SMR being uh, uh, brought. Um, oops, sorry, this question is jumping. <laughs> uh, where was I? I often hear SMR being brought in relation to semi or non permanent, such as barge examples. Yet the more common approach appears fully permanent, which would avoid potential country specific construction licensing benefits. So. Uh, this is uh, an interesting question, and when you talk to some of the reactor manufacturers, they are talking to regulators and trying to argue that the rules that are applied for large reactors should not apply to their SMR reactors. I think that won't happen. I do not believe that the public opinion will allow lower safety rules on um, small reactors than they allow on large reactors, because there is no reason why they should. You know, a 50 megawatt machine going super critical is still a problem. So uh, I 
uh, but it is an important problem. And if you look at uh, the costs of Hinkley Point, the regulatory costs are big. Um, that's why the that's why if Sizewell, if it happens, the 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 manufacturers that the that EDF uh, is trying to developer is trying to um, make it a direct repeat wherever possible of Hinkley Point in order to minimise arguments with the uh, regulator. Um, I do not personally. I mean, there, there, is a, there are, for example, barges in, in, in Russia with small reactors on them. Um, and let's be honest, uh, the, the UK has submarines with reactors on them. <laughs> um, uh, but the military isn't uh, subject to the same rules as, as, as the rest of us. So I doubt that in most of the Western world that that will be that there will be any change in uh, like in regulatory requirements and licensing compared with today's large machines. But certainly the reactor manufacturers are lobbying for it. Yeah, thank you. Then Hunter Wolf, if moisture is seen to be more critical, couldn't we look at uh, an optimum reheat slash TTD by the SMR? and how to evaluate uh, that economically. So, uh, how big is an interesting question. I think um, we we need to recognize, first of all, that the a lot of the moisture problems are in the HP, not just in the LP. So before we get to the moisture separator heater. Um, I think uh, the degree of superheat is uh, obviously it's d driven by our, our the coolant from the gas from the reactor, but we could put more money into the area to get a bit bit drier, and that may evaluate. It's something that we could certainly look at. We need actually a better understanding today or than today of exactly what the moisture losses will be in this machine, um, and I cannot speak for other companies, but uh, GE is uh, investing in its uh, moisture modeling in order to better understand and better be able to make those kind of optimizations. Yep, thank you. Then, next question What about one SMR to multiple SDGs? So there's no, there's really no benefit in this. The point is, if you've got reactor on, you want to generate all the power you can from it. So you, uh, and if you put it into one SGG, it's more efficient than if you put it into multiple SGGs. Um, um, so there is, there is no benefit in doing it that way around. Um, multiple, the advantage of multiple SMRs to, to one SGG, arguably is that you only have you have the advantage of a high performance SGG and you can still use it if not so well when one of the reactors is down. Yep, thank you. I don't know, are there any further questions? Um, but Pete, I would have one question. You you mentioned yeah, moisture as as one of the big challenges. Um, do you think it's worth uh, putting, uh, let's say, more testing in this field? So testing it in smaller scale or or in test beds um, to investigate uh, yeah the effect of this. So the basic physics of this. Um, has been has been tested um, um, in turbines and um, um, the most and and um, um, uh, I don't know if people have ever heard of a guy at Birmingham called Freddie Baxter, but he had an amazing test rig where he could create super cooled steam upstream of a cascade and then expand the rest of his cascade. So he did um, some very fundamental work on cascades with with wet steam and different degrees of supercooling and so on. And I said there is a lot of data in test rigs. Um, I uh, it's it's not clear to me yet 
Picking up on Hartwig's question, though, how these droplets will separate in an MSR is one area which I think may, may be worth more testing, um, particularly when we look at more um, uh, sophisticated heat exchanges in the, in the MSR. So I don't know. I mean, let, let's, we, we've all got results for scaled LP turbines. We all know how much worse they are than real LP turbine. Right. Thanks. Good. Well, if there are no further questions, then we can end uh, uh, today's session here. So I would like to thank again uh, Pete for taking the time, putting together the presentation and, and answering all the questions. Uh, uh, I've personally found it uh, very useful and I learned something new. <laughs> Um, uh, so thank you very much and uh, thank you all uh, who joined today. Uh, I hope you also learned something, uh, something new. Good. Well, thank you all. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yes, bye. Bye bye.